acknowledge that um, things were not meeting their service standards. And they said, uh, we want to earn your business and we need to make changes in the underwriting and the leadership. And they have moved into um, force with that. Um, and so on that day, I first just announced that it was taking place. And this is um, the guy who hosted it, this Mark Scalercio, who is the head of all distribution. And One America dis distributes its products through a number of different channels, through banks, through independent brokerage, through IMOs, through um, uh, the independent channel, and from what we know, the career channel. That's what we're in, even though we have both preferred brokers and career agents, uh, we're in the career channel. And they announced this new guy, Chris Coudre, as the head of that. And um, he has been with One America. In fact, he was in this position before. He's been with One America 15 plus years, and um, they put him back in this position and um, uh, one of the things that he announced was, I want to earn your business. I want to listen. I want to be part of um, uh, responding to the field. We want to partner with you. I thought that was a pretty good um, message. And then today, I already got an email from him this morning and says, I told you back in early December that I'm committed to these things. We're going to listen to you. We're going to earn your business every day rather than expect your business. And we're going to build our partnership based on mutual commitment. So I'm just impressed because this has not been the posture of late. And so this is a great start and, um, not, and he's following it up with action. He's saying, Hey, um, uh, in, the, in that spirit, I want to schedule a, a bunch of listening sessions, and I'm doing that with certain GAs and AGAs and sales directors and career agents. And so I'm one of those people, and that's, that's a testament to you because we're building something. We're putting up um, good numbers. We're respected. And so I thought this was a great uh, entree into this new spirit of where things are going. So I, when you share your messages with me of ideas or uh, things that aren't going right or things that are going right or that you like, I pass that on. There's no guarantee that you, know, you have this great idea that, hey, they didn't follow up and do that. No, we're never guaranteed because we might just be the only person saying that. But the fact that um, we're, they're listening to us and we're carrying it forward and they're trying to earn our business. I think this is all a very, very good thing. Uh, with that also said, um, they made an announcement, uh, I think this was last week, um, that they realized, hey, we did not uh, deliver on our best, on, we did not meet our standards. And and so they're saying here at the end of the year and going into next year, we're going to give double credit for conference. And conferences, if you're a career agent, um, then you can earn um, uh, credits towards a conference, an all expense paid conference that your spouse or significant other is invited to and is also paid for. And you can bring kids and grandkids. I've now gone to two or three, three of these. Uh, we didn't have one in the year of COVID and they're just really cool. They're, they're at cool sites. Uh, last year we were in Florida. The one coming up next year is in Denver, um, big resort, uh, bring in speakers. Um, you hear a message from the CEO and the um, you know, the leader of the field, but then there's outside speakers. It's how I heard John Acuff and, um, it, and it's just very inspirational, great connections, and then just a ton of free time um, to uh, explore and have fun with others and good food and all that good stuff. 
Um, Chris Gandy has been there, obviously, the last couple of years as the number one producer. Eric Nagel was there last year. Both of those guys have um, uh, achieved this level already. And so they're qualifying. And what they're saying with this is if you're close, we're going to count your December production and we're going to give you an one month in 2022 to qualify for 2021. And we'll count that double. So that might impact some of you who are close that, okay, we're, I got business in there and I got business coming. And if I issued that in January, it's going to count twice for the leaders conference that is supposed to be ending 2021 qualification period. So that's really cool. That's generous. I've never seen anything like that before. And then they're saying, okay, maybe 2021 is out of reach for you, but going, or you're brand new and you're coming into this game, 2022 qualification. So the, we run on a whole calendar year for 2022 to go on a trip in 2023. They're going to give double credit in the months of January, February, and March. So pretty incredible is January is a magic month. It's counting for the 2022 conference and counting for the 2023 conference. Um, if you want to know how this impacts you personally, um, talk to us, talk to me, talk to Colleen. We can look at your situation. If you've got people that are thinking of coming on board, if you're in pre-contract or if you're, however this all uh, plays out, I think this is a really excellent message on their part and acknowledging that We've stubbed our toe some and we're committed to getting better and we're committed to working with you to go forward. So I don't know if there's any questions with any of that. If you're here or if you want to do sidebar conversations on any of that, we're happy, happy to do that. Um, some of you might ask, well, what is conference level? What, how much FYC do I have to do? That depends on your year that you joined, the fact that you've been there before, there's it's a graduated piece. So instead of trying to explain it all to you, um, have a sidebar uh, conversation. So there's several of you on this call who should be really excited about this and be saying, man, I am gonna get off to a great start in 2022 and uh, earn this conference. And boy, would it be great if we had a, a just a, a big crew there. You know, this is, this is a time um, when we do a lot of kind of business planning and looking to the future. And that's what makes this uh, video, um, this Simon Sinek little lecture, this TED Talk, um, very, very appropriate. Um, and um, Jason, did you have something you wanted to tee up ahead of time or, did, or was it afterwards? Afterwards. Okay, awesome. And one of the cool things, I mean, we'll watch this. It's, it's literally 18 minutes long. Then we'll have conversation around it and um, uh, would ask that you turn your video on then. When we, when we converse, it helps so much more to see people's faces and to be engaged that way. And so that would be the encouragement after this video plays. All right, with that, Ms. Colleen, uh, can you, I'll stop my share and you start your video. Hi, I'm not Hi. now. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, I got something to say before I say that. Um, uh, I missed out on my uh, in my announcements. We're gonna punt on the Christmas party. I said we were gonna reschedule it, and given what's going on and the CDC and saying don't have social gatherings, we're not gonna do it for right now. We will have something, but I'm not putting it in early January just because I don't wanna cancel it at the last minute. 
You do want to put this date down, Eric Essex, because I know you're a planner and put stuff on your calendar right away. Uh, January 19th is our kickoff meeting, our all firm wide meeting. Um, probably at 9 a.m. Uh, we will um, do that in person. Um, if, if you're afraid or, or if you live a long ways away like Jody, uh, we will give a Zoom feature, but January 19th, put that on your calendar. Um, and we will have a uh, recognition and further announcements and well up pieces as we grow out into this uh, new chapter for us. How is that, Colleen, for a little stall there so that you can uh, get what it going? What a great stall. Yeah. Ready. Can everybody hear and see? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight. The Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operated it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. Nah. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. 
We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You ready to buy a computer from me? All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products and they can make perfectly well-designed products and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision-making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures, it just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you. Those aren't the other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that, you know, there's, uh, if you, if you, if you, um, Hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot-com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, when you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the permute, same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well-connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, 
Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright brothers' team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream worked with them with, for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight and no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys, and I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first. He didn't get rich. He didn't get famous. So he quit. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first two and a half percent of our population are our innovators. The next 13 and a half percent of our population are our early adopters. The next 34 percent are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchtone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> We all sit at various places at various times on the scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10% proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling. Oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours or stood in, six, in line for six hours was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out about eight or nine years ago to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well-funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk Time Warner DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. 
In fact, I don't think it's even traded above six, except for a couple of little spikes. Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you. We don't need it. We don't like it. You're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now, let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, you know, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own and they told people. And some of those people uh, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed. And it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there are two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the civil rights movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. <laughs> Listen to politicians now with their comprehensive 12 point plans and not inspiring anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority, but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. <laughs> people don't buy what you do they buy why you do it i just love them. so why do you do what you do uh two weeks ago i introduced uh jason nelson as our new a VP of culture and development and helping us build our practices. He suggested uh, this video series. It's funny, when I watched it this morning, I remembered that I watched this the day I came up with the name of Wella and um, was sharing it with some people. And it was just very a good, good step back in memory lane. Um, and Jason's going to help uh, facilitate, you know, this kind of conversation and feedback around um, this um, this video that we just watched. So, with that, Jason, I'll throw it to you. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Hey, I've been able to meet some of you, and I'm really looking forward to catching up with the rest of you. Um, but for the sake of today, we're just going to kind of dive in this next half hour. Dennis uh, recapped that session really, really well. 
if you didn't catch it, uh, you probably weren't paying attention. Um, Simon talked about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speech, the I Have a Dream speech. And of course that speech was famous because of the vision, but also because he repeated, I have a dream. Well, Simon repeated something over and over in that last session we just watched and Dennis said it and we'll say it again. It was people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I don't know if you buy into that or not. Uh, it's okay if you don't, um, or it's okay if you buy into it at different levels. I certainly buy into it. And we think it has some significant meaning to our industry. Uh, we get to have direct interface with our customers as advisors and language is a pretty significant piece around that interaction, whether it's prospecting or actually doing the business of what we do. And so I think we're in a really great position to be able to articulate our why in ways that maybe other companies or other industries aren't as able to do it. And so I think the bottom line out of this time that we have here now is we just wanna encourage all of us to know our why and maybe be willing to communicate it. Some of you perhaps are already there. Uh, if you are, this can maybe encourage you or sharpen you in that. But if you haven't yet done the, the exercise of knowing your why, uh, which is really a belief thing, and then taking the step to maybe find ways to articulate it, this could be something that really enhances uh, what you do uh, in 2022. So let's just kind of do some back and forth here real quick um, so that we kind of understand the golden circle because that's the, the centerpiece of this. So the golden circle is why is in the center, right? The next tier out was the how, how we do what we do. And then the, the next circle out was the what we do. And Simon talked about how most of what we talk about, most of what we focus on, most of what we try to sell to our people is what we do. Uh, and it's important that we do what we do really, really well. But there's these other things going on. But this is kind of a no brainer. But let's just kind of fire away. What are the things that we do in the financial services industry? What are things that would fall into that category? Just kind of open rapid fire. Let's hear it. Provide security. Okay. Yeah. Provide security. And you know what, Jason, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to add a boy you on that one because that I think is a higher status than what we do. That is definitely what we do provide security, but that one is really good because I think that has the potential to go even deeper into maybe the why space, but we provide security. What else do we do? Sell life insurance. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Sell life. Uh huh. I think we provide people a peace of mind also. Yeah. Give people peace of mind. Mm -hmm. How about more in the, the real literal, the real tangible? Um, the obvious thing that Dennis kind of put out. We sell life insurance. We put people into investments. What else are some of the things that we do in sort of that literal space? I would say we um, provide people freedom. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's great. If we uh, we help people design a budget. Mm -hmm. Yep. Secure a family's future. There you go. Absolutely. Help people get out of debt. Uh huh. Very good. Help people retire. Help people pass on their legacy. Uh, we meet with people. Or, or yeah. we beg with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's really good. Um, and and kind of like what I was telling Jason, I think some of you many of you actually clearly already have this why mindset, because I think you said some things that actually are your why, not really your what. Uh, those would be things like security, peace, freedom, right? Um, those are definitely things that it's fair to say that you do, but really those I think are closer to your why. So as we continue this conversation, think about whether those are indeed part of your why, but let's go to the how. 
how do we do what we do? And this will be different according to our own practice, but in general, there's kind of a, a main space that we're in too, especially within Wella. So what are some things that would describe how we do what we do? By getting them, getting them the best product that fits their needs. There you go. Mm -hmm. Product selection, product differentiation, fitting people into things. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, that, that takes an analysis, right? And that's, that's a how for sure. What are some other hows? I know a couple guys on my left. I don't know if they're on the left of your screen. <laughs> I've got, um, I've got Eric on my top left and Jason is right beneath him. And I look up to my left and I think I've heard both of these guys talk about money guide pro. So money guide pro is how those guys and probably some of the other ones of us deliver analysis and results about people's financial situation. So that would be another one. We use, a, we use software, we use tools. We break down people's financial story. We ask questions and find out what's important to people. Yeah, excellent. Absolutely, we ask a lot of questions. We get a lot of data. You know, getting and capturing that snapshot and all of those details is really important. We don't want to miss something. That's another thing that we do. We have a process and a path that everyone follows and goes down. Mm, yeah, that's great. We don't just wing it. We don't just have a one-timer. We actually have a process and that's how we do what we do. How do we take somebody from where they're at to greater financial strength? Well, we take them through a process. Outstanding. How about one last one or two that maybe some of you believe for yourselves or you've seen in the industry are really great differentiators? Because if you caught Simon, the how is where we differentiate ourselves a little bit more from competition. What is pretty much the same for many of us, depending on our industry, but the how is where we get a chance to sort of distinguish ourselves a little bit. So how about an example or two that's a little bit more focus differentiated sets us apart or sets you apart how about different designations that we've studied and gotten our licenses absolutely yeah. yeah for sure that's a good one so uh eric that's expertise right expertise credibility um very very good and even with you you know being a part of the the national associations and, and sort of being in the know and, and trying to share that expertise um, that is a differentiator for sure. That's a good one. How about one more of those types? We use stories, maybe personal mm. experience of um, a family member where long-term care helped their family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Stories I, I also, from life. Go ahead, Dennis. I, I also think of how people deliver their financial planning. Like there are people who put together a custom report or package and, and it different and they and they follow up on a regular basis. They set that, you know, okay, we're gonna get together two times a year and review your plan. And that, that that's how they do it and that really differentiates them. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, versus a more transactional approach or just simply a needs-based approach, not necessarily considering future. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, this one um, I thought might have been a little more difficult just in general, but the fact that some of you answered some whys right out of the gate, I think we're going to be really good at this. But let's just dream together if it's your own or if it's others that you can think of. But what would be some key words or phrases that could describe why our practice might do what it do, what it does and like i said before i think we had some good starters things like we give people security we give people peace of mind we give people freedom those are fantastic um, i'll give you mine just to kind of prime the pump i've been using this in my prospecting uh, and in the final sale so to speak since the beginning of my career and and i'll say something like 
Life can be beautiful, meaningful, and good. I help people experience life to the fullest by taking advantage of money opportunities. I put that in my opening, let's schedule a, a first time meeting email. I, I, I speak that out in my prospecting phone call. I send somebody off with it at the end of a process. And you know, it can seem like sometimes people aren't really catching on to that or it really doesn't add value, but I think Simon would beg to differ, right? He says that that kind of thing builds trust. But what are some other ones that we could come up with? Let's fire away on that. And let's go back, actually, let's go back to Dennis. You shared about Wella and, and I'll, I'll articulate what I think what I think Wella's why is, we haven't talked about this, but you mentioned kind of you thought about why the day you started Wella. So obviously there's gotta be something in the name of Wella. Wella is an old English word that means wellness and prosperity. So I would venture to bet that some of the why of Wella is to give people well-being and to help them be prosperous. But pass, fail, a C, where, where, where are we at on that, Dennis? No, you are exactly right. And, and um, um, prosperity is not just about money. Prosperity is um, about people reaching their potential. And, mm -hmm. and I, I believe people are prosperous when they reach their full potential or are striving to reach their full potential. And that's why we equip and empower and encourage people to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Great. I think uh, when I think of, um, uh, you're putting words in my mouth, I'll put words in Milan's mouth. When, <laughs> uh, I, I just knowing him as the uh, Medicare doctor or Dr. Medicare, um, uh, there's lots of people who peddle Medicare products out there um, and and sling them around and don't always even know how they work themselves and I think his why is to go above and beyond and provide the best education and service to his clients um, that they don't have access to uh, otherwise and I've seen him demonstrate that and go the go the extra mile and so I would say that's his why. Mm. How accurate am I? You're right on. I'm already already coming up with ideas how to change my marketing scheme of of the first or second sentence in any presentation for me should be I believe that everyone should have the right to go to any doctor, mm. the best doctor, any hospital that they want. They should not have to go through pre-authorizations, pre-approvals. And I always use something, my why is to develop a family. Uh, I always say at some point in my presentation that all my clients become clients, then they become friends, and then they always end up family. Very and I build, I build a family. And um, yeah, so I have a lot. This has been really good. because I'm going to definitely change my marketing hmm. of what I believe that and I want to bring to my family. Nice. Anybody else want to throw out a potential why, whether it's yours or not, something that could be? I got Eric Essex, but I want to hear him say it. <laughs> well, the short and sweet one that I use is um, that always gets a ha from people says, I want to help you retire to something, not from something. And that always they go, oh, and then that always opened up the conversation line as to what do you mean by that? Mm. Yeah, and what that is, Eric, is you're, you're, you're poking at a dream. You're poking at something new. Uh, you're giving them hope, possibility when you lift out to versus from. Here's uh, some. That's, I, I, that's not, I would have, uh, I would have, I hear Eric always talk about helping people articulate their needs, wants, and wishes. And his why is helping them to, to find that and then build the plan that encompasses that. And, um, and 
and whether that's his why or not, I just know I hear him talk about <laughs> seeds, wants, and wishes all the time. This, this yeah. is what I, I would say, Dennis, that's his how. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That is how he does something unique to that client. Differentiates him, but it's still pretty close to the what he does. Whereas, like Eric said, pointing people to what could be possible in their life is, is a little closer to the why. Cool. Here's some other things I just kind of came up with on a brainstorm. I don't know if these make sense, but these, these are phrases we could see in our whys. Uh, attain, we help you attain your destiny. Uh, be independent. Have security for uncertain times. Um, Jason already nailed that one. Achieving dreams. That's kind of like what Eric is saying there. Clarity in an overstimulating world. Peace of mind. Um, somebody said peace of mind. That was great. Get control over your life. These are the kinds of things, along with the ones before, freedom, you know, prosperity, other things that we've talked about, those are closer to the why space. So when you do this, really make sure you're challenging yourself to actually come up with a why. And the reason why we need to do that is because we don't live in the land of why very often. We are in such a what do we do world. We are in such a what do we do life. And the best version that we tend to get to is a how, and, and we really don't think on the why level very often, but we should. And that's kind of Simon's next point. Um, I think in our industry, uh, you would probably all agree. One of the things that is most important to creating a client relationship is trust. And um, in Simon's book, he, he even articulates that he believes trust is the most important thing in any, any business, but Trust is what helps us connect with people on a why level, where they believe in our why. They believe in what we believe in. And we'll do business with anybody that wants to do business with us. We need revenue. There's an economy to this. But isn't it great when somebody does business with us that shares our values or shares our beliefs or shares our why? That's when it really gets good and really gets fun. And so I want to share a quote about the whole trust thing uh, as we go on. Can everybody see this okay? Yep. Okay. So this is actually from the book, um, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Trust does not emerge simply because a seller makes a rational case why the customer should buy a product or service or because an executive promises change. Trust is not a checklist. Fulfilling all your responsibilities does not create trust. Trust is a feeling, not a rational experience. We trust some people and companies even when things go wrong. And we don't trust others even though everything may have gone exactly as it should have. A completed checklist does not guarantee trust. Trust begins to emerge when we have a sense that another person or organization is driven by things other than their own self gain. Second paragraph, with trust comes a sense of value, real value, not just value equated with money. Value by definition is the transference of trust. You can't convince someone you have value just as you can't convince someone to trust you. You have to earn trust by communicating and demonstrating that you share the same values and beliefs. You have to talk about your why and prove it with what you do. A why is just a belief. Hows are the actions we take to realize that belief and what are the result of those actions. When all three are in balance, trust is built and value is perceived. This isn't just about why. It's not like we're throwing the what's and the hows out the window. We, we really have to deliver on those things. And it is difficult to come up with a how. You know, those things that really differentiate us, those are very strategic, very, very difficult things to really become proficient in. So we need to put together the whole package. But the main point that we're trying to kind of stir up today is that everything starts with why. And why is actually the easiest one to come up with. It's a belief. It's you. Uh, people buy you. They don't buy your service or your product. And so what are you about? What is your why? And like that quote said, uh, really what we're trying to earn is trust, not a sale. And when we can get somebody to trust us, uh, perhaps the business side of things will come a little bit more naturally. So we've got five minutes or so. Um, I've mentioned the book. We read a quote from the book. So this, this right here is 
sort of Simon's breakout book. It's called Start With Why. And we have 12 of these brand new copies that we're willing to get you if you want one. If you're going to open it, <laughs> even if you only read two chapters, I mean, there's two chapters that pretty much flesh out what you saw in the TED Talk. Even if you're only going to read two chapters, great, let us send it to you. But if you want this book, um, why don't you just go ahead in the comments or in the chat, I should say, and just give a thumbs up or put your name and we will literally get this thing in the mail and you can maybe be inspired by it. But Milan said he's going to give this a try as we kind of wrap up. Anybody else going to continue thinking about this or maybe continue doing it if you're already doing it? Where, where do you stand on this as we're finishing up? I think it's really connecting with your clients. And, um, and I am more informational based and service based. And I have to get back to the why, why do I actually do this? And, you know, the simple definition is you should be able to go to the best doctors, have the best care. And I truly believe in that. And I kind of do it throughout my presentation, but I have to rethink my marketing. And it's, this has been very good. And I'm going to get the audio book if you don't mind. <laughs> That's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah. I don't have time to read. We're not with it, are we? There you go. All right. Audio books. You got it. <laughs> you, 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 you know, uh, I, um, I think I talked about this earlier in the year. I, I learned from uh, uh, John Acuff that if you listen to the audiobook and have the other one in front of you and just turn the pages, put it on about one and a half speed and the retention just goes through the roof. So you're listening to him read to you. And I know you want to do it in the car. And so you don't want to be <laughs> But uh, I did that on a plane and uh, read the book so much faster than I would have and retained a ton. Yeah. What speed you put it at? One and a half. Okay. All right. We'll be flying in the next few months a lot. Okay. <laughs> Don't miss one key piece of this. It's not just about knowing your why. You have to communicate your why. You have to say it, show it. Yes, that can show up in your marketing and in your brand, um, but that's not really where it's going to be most received. If you talk about it and you demonstrate it, people are going to catch it. And that's, I think that's the real challenge for us once we have our whys to actually speak about it. Yeah, that, that's a good one, uh, Jason, because like, I think I, I know my why, but I, like it takes me a paragraph as opposed to I can just spin it out and this is my why and and then if people want to ask questions about that sure we can get into conversation but it should be just crisp this is my why nice well dennis keep going any ways you want to finish us out i think we're a couple minutes to noon we do have quite a few people who want the book so yeah did you capture those <laughs> or... we better yeah merry christmas from wella you get a book. Yeah. I know you're hoping for a bonus. Maybe that's coming too. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Jason, for leading that. Appreciate you all. Merry Christmas to everyone. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah, Jeff. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Everybody Merry Christmas. Everybody stay safe. Merry Christmas. Great stuff. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye. Take happy, healthy holidays and continue it into the new year. <laughs>